You're listening to the Youth Bible in One Year, Day 2. And you may already be having questions about this Bible in One Year journey. And you're not quite sure what to expect. You're not quite sure what the first day was all about. You're a bit confused. Well, today's devotion is your first question. And it's all about the significance of each question that we see in today's passages. The first question in the Psalms is about Jesus. The first question in the New Testament is about Jesus. And the first question in the Bible is all about God's goodness. So let's find out the answer to each of these questions in today's devotion. What is your first question going to be? I was preparing my cross-examination for one of the first criminal trials in which I was involved when I was working as a barrister. A senior and experienced lawyer was helping me prepare. He showed me the significance of a first question. From Psalm 2 Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. The first question in the Psalms is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The safest place to be in life is close to Jesus. Paul, preaching the gospel in Antioch, quotes this psalm. He says, We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. It is Jesus who is his anointed. The Hebrew word here is Messiah, Messiah. He is the Christ, the son of God, whom we are to love. Kiss his son. The psalm's original context probably concerned a particular situation involving a human king of Israel. Yet as we read it, with a larger horizon in mind, we see that the first question asked in the psalms points forward in anticipation to Jesus. Why do people conspire and plot against him? This is exactly what we see happening in the New Testament. Even in today's passage in relation to Jesus, right from the start of Jesus' life, we see rulers gathering together and conspiring and plotting in vain. Yet the psalm ends, Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied are all those who seek refuge and put their trust in him. With all the storms of life, and supremely the storms of Jesus' coming in final judgment, the only safe place to be is in him. Lord, thank you that as I look to the year ahead, and all the potential challenges, opportunities, and possibilities, The safest place to be is in you. New Testament from Matthew 2 After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. The first question in the New Testament is about Jesus. The whole of the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. The Magi, often referred to as the wise men, sense the significance of Jesus' birth. They asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? They sought and found him. When they saw the child, they bowed down and worshipped him. They recognized that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams of the people up to his birth. Jesus is the one who fulfills all God's promises. Today we see three more examples. First, the place of his birth. Matthew saw that even the place of Jesus' birth was prophesied. It was out of Bethlehem that the ruler and shepherd would arise, for this is what the prophet had written. Second, exile in Egypt. When Herod tried to kill Jesus, the family escaped to Egypt. Matthew writes, So was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Third, slaughter of the children. When Herod ordered the murder of all boys under the age of two, this fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah. Lord Jesus, today I want to bow down and worship you. I want to offer you everything I have, my life, my all. Old Testament from Genesis 2 to 4 Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The first question in the Bible is about God's 
goodness. Do you ever find yourself doubting whether God's way really is the best? Do you find yourself wondering whether, even though God says it's wrong, something is worth trying anyway? God gave to humankind everything they could possibly want. The whole created world was made for us to enjoy. Every possible need was catered for. The pinnacle of God's creation was humankind. The need for community was solved by the creation of other human beings. It's not good for the man to be alone. It started with the beautiful gift of marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Marriage is the lifelong union of a man and a woman in which sex, another of God's beautiful gifts, is to be enjoyed with intimacy and freedom, without guilt or shame. Yet despite this abundant provision of everything good, human beings look for something more and they succumb to the temptation to take forbidden fruit. The temptation was started with doubts about God. Here is the first question in the Bible. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Behind this question is the demonic lie that God is withholding from you something that is really exciting. Eve's first mistake was to engage with the snake in conversation. We're created to converse with God, not the devil. The devil in the form of the snake fools Eve into thinking that there will be no consequences to her sin. You will not certainly die. He imputes bad motives to God. But God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. It is often the case that you swallow a lie about God before you swallow forbidden fruit. The fruit looked good and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. This is often how temptation appears. Adam and Eve sinned and, as so frequently happens, cover-up followed the sin. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Next, the first question God asks in the Bible is about you. Adam and Eve's friendship with God was broken. When they heard God coming, they hid. But God immediately came looking for them. And we find his first question in the Bible. Where are you? God did not give up on them. Whenever you fall away from God, God comes searching for you, wanting the relationship to be restored. He says to the snake that one of Eve's descendants will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Jesus is the one who will crush the head of the snake, but there will be a cost. You will strike his heel. We see here the first hint of what it will cost to restore the relationship. On the cross, Jesus crushed Satan, but it cost him his life. His blood was shed so that you and I could be forgiven and our relationship with God restored. Next, the first question human beings ask is about responsibility. Am I my brother's keeper? This is the crucial question for today. Do you have responsibility for others? The result of the fall is a broken relationship with God. Adam and Eve blamed each other. And in chapter 4, we read that their children also fell out with each other. Arguments, quarrelling and falling out with one another began here. It has blighted the human race ever since. Try to avoid arguments. You will rarely win one and they are so destructive. Cain was angry with his brother Abel. God's questioning continued. Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. You will either master sin, now through the power of the cross and resurrection with the help of the Spirit, or else sin will master you. In Cain's case, it did. He killed his brother. God asked him yet another question. Where is your brother Abel? In response, Cain asked the first question by a human being in the Bible. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain wanted to avoid responsibility. He was saying, do I really have responsibility for anyone other than myself? The biblical answer is that you do have responsibility for others. We cannot exempt ourselves from responsibility for what is happening around us. In our city, nation and the world, for example, we cannot accept that thousands of children die every day as a result of extreme poverty and simply say, it's not our responsibility. Not only do you have responsibility towards your fellow human beings, but it is your privilege to bring blessing and joy to your friends, family 
and all those around you and to make a difference in the lives of as many people as possible. Lord, thank you that you have created this wonderful universe for us to enjoy in relationship with you. Help me this year to fulfill the potential I have to make a difference in other people's lives. Pippa adds, I always feel rather traumatized when I read Matthew 2, verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. What a terrible thing Herod did to the vulnerable, just because he felt insecure about his own position. Are you ever in danger of putting others down? to try and secure your own position. Let's pray now. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for what I've learnt and thank you for the things that I still don't know. Lord, I pray for today. I ask that you would be beside me at all times. I ask for your Holy Spirit to fill me today. In Jesus' name, Amen. 